And now that I'm recording, gonna get this going. So welcome everyone. Uh, again, nice to see so many familiar faces and some new faces. Thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat. My name is John Griffith. Uh, I'm a curriculum developer uh, working for the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Science at CU Boulder, uh, but currently uh, live in central Vermont. Um, with my partner, Nicole, and uh, my three-month-old, Pearlie, who's screaming downstairs right now. So hopefully none of you can hear that. Uh, and tonight, um, we're going, I'm excited to introduce uh, and, and explore this resource with you that focuses on mega droughts in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, this is one of seven different data puzzle resources that we have up on our website. And just to a kind of little backstory here, or what is a data puzzle? A data puzzle is this new resource we're working on. It's a data analysis resource uh, that incorporates ambitious science teaching practices to help students make sense of science phenomena. And so the goal tonight is that we, as a group, engage with um, ambitious science teaching practices in the context of this mega drought in the Colorado River Basin data puzzle. Uh, and hopefully you leave here tonight um, feeling confident in your ability to facilitate this, this resource in your classrooms, should you so choose. So hopefully I'm going to talk through some different strategies uh, and, and point you to all of the different um, tasks that, that are included in here. So you're feeling good about uh, your ability to use this, should, should you so choose. And like we've like I've said with uh, in the previous two web data puzzle webinars, those of you that are interested in utilizing this resource in your classroom and providing feedback by completing a, a survey um, will receive a $50 Amazon gift card from us. So just wanted to add that little incentive here before we get going. Wanted to um, real quick, introduce myself a bit further and, and the team that we've got developing this resources. So like I said, I'm John Griffith. I work for the Ceres Education and Outreach Team. Uh, again, Ceres, a cooperative institute for research and environmental science. It's a cooperative um, between NOAA and CU Boulder. So there are 800 scientists that are a part of this series organization. And my job on the education outreach team as a curriculum developer is to bring their research, this contemporary research into K-12 classrooms by developing uh, hopefully what is innovative uh, resources and curricula. Um, on this data puzzles team, I'm joined by my uh, supervisor, Dr. Anna Gold. Um, also really fortunate to work with some other folks at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, one of the co-authors of the actual ambitious science teaching book, Dr. Melissa Bratton, who's at the CU Boulder School of Ed. Uh, really fortunate to be able to make a data analysis resource in, that's infused with ambitious science teaching practices with uh, Melissa, who wrote the book. Uh, and also um, working with us on this project is Dr. Carrie Winger. Uh, for those of you that have heard of Inquiry Hub, um, kind of the high school version of Open Syed, the storylining curricula. Um, she, we got her on the team as well. So I, I feel really fortunate to, to get to work with such a powerhouse team and get to learn from, from these folks. Uh, my background is in uh, paleoclimate um, and, and did a lot of work in Alaska, but fell in love with uh, being a TA during my time in grad school and transitioned into an eighth grade classroom where I taught for six years. So this work, I've um, been very fortunate to be able to work and learn and engage with contemporary science, but also my passion is in education. And so getting to work, kind of have feet in both worlds is, is really, um, really fortunate. So all that said, let's get into it here. I wanted to give, for those of you that are joining tonight for the first time, just a little bit of backstory about where data puzzles, um, where this came from. And so when I was hired to join this series team in 2019, my primary job, my primary responsibility was to connect the public 
to this mosaic Arctic research expedition. So this is still an ongoing piece of my work, uh, but in 2019 and 2020, that full year, that was what I was doing. And, and we were fortunate to connect uh, thousands of classrooms from around, around the world to this expedition with curricula, virtual reality tours, scientist calls, among other things. And after the field portion of the expedition ended, classrooms were wondering how they could, could stay connected, stay involved, and how they could look at some real data from, from the Arctic. And so that is something, you know, given that we have access to 800 scientists, dozens of which participated in this mosaic expedition, um, we, we really saw it was our responsibility to get authentic data sets into classrooms. Uh, and some of the units that I had written, um, I felt like had some really compelling stories and some really compelling data sets, but they were buried in the units. And I wanted to extract those stories, extract those data sets into a data analysis resource. So we reached out to the folks at Data Nuggets initially and, and worked with them to create a Data Nugget, which is a really awesome framework put together by folks at Michigan State uh, to bring data sets into classrooms. And so you'll see some of the, some of the Data Nugget strategies infused into these data puzzle resources, um, but ultimately, for us, we wanted to try to infuse some uh, contemporary pedagogical practices into this data analysis resource. So we have like this data puzzles is now this blend of data nuggets and daily do's and ambitious science teaching practices. Um, and so that's, that's how we got here. And of course, recruiting Melissa Bratton to join us in this project has, has been hugely helpful. So for those of you that may not be familiar with ambitious science teaching practices, this is a pedagogical framework with principles, practices, and tools to support meaningful and equitable science education. You can see these practices spelled out in this, in this circle here where each quadrant represents a different practice. Uh, the first practice, planning for engagement with important science ideas, really trying to think about what are those big ideas that students need to know in, a, in order to construct a, a final explanation. So kind of backwards design thinking here. Uh, and then moving into this eliciting students' ideas as key resources for sense making. This is something that we really uh, are trying to, to do not only in data puzzle resources, but all the curricula that we're developing is trying to extract student experiences, student language, student ideas early on and utilize those ideas, those experiences, that language as resources to help students make sense of, of phenomena or of important science concepts later on in the, the lesson or unit. After we elicit students' ideas, thinking about how do we support students' ongoing changes in thinking, it's a working with students' ideas that we've already elicited to refine that thinking. And finally, this last practice, pressing students to construct strong evidence-based explanations and models. And you'll see in these data puzzles resources, we're looking for students to develop explanatory models as kind of their summative assessment for, for the resource. Now, if you look at the, the circle here, these quadrants, um, what we have done with, with data puzzles is we've swapped the eliciting and the important science ideas quadrants. And we did this with Melissa's permission uh, and the other co-authors permission. Um, and the reason being is we're not asking you to, to plan for engaging with the science ideas. We're already doing that for you. So with ambitious science teaching and what that looks like in data puzzles, we actually start with the eliciting of students' ideas. Before we introduce any science ideas or any data sets, we want to help students connect to the scientists' research by eliciting ideas about similar or related events or scenarios. And this came out of our work with uh, connecting students with the Arctic, right? Like students haven't really, many students, I should say, haven't really thought about the Arctic most probably haven't been or visited the Arctic. And so before we start saying, before we start exploring concepts and science focused on the Arctic, like we want to try to find some related, some related thing that students might be able to connect with 
back at home um, and then help kind of ease their way up to the concepts that, that might be related to, to the Arctic and what we're trying to study. So that this this idea kind of came out of our work with, with Mosaic and the Arctic. So we start with eliciting students' ideas. And then after we elicit those ideas, the student language experiences, so on and so forth, we connect uh, students to the scientists and their work via an, inter via an interactive reading. And, and throughout that, uh, this second practice here, we're challenging students to make connections between the opening scenario and what they've read and engaged with in that interactive reading. This practice here ends with a prediction. Students make a prediction about a, a question a scientist is actively investigating and all that is presented in the text. And then the students will uh, test that prediction uh, by analyzing an authentic data set. Uh, and so the goal here is that students are identifying patterns, explaining those patterns, and then figuring out whether uh, the data sets confirm or refute their prediction. And um, the last practice here, explanatory model construction, students are going to communicate new science ideas by constructing a conceptual model, more or less an annotated sketch that uh, incorporates ideas um, that maybe their own ideas, important science ideas from the puzzle text, as well as the data set uh, to create this annotated sketch explaining uh, the overall science question. And so we'll look, at, we're going to engage with each of these practices tonight. Uh, and I'll kind of model how, how you would implement these different practices again in the context of this mega droughts in the Colorado River Basin data puzzle. You should know that this framework, it's the same framework for all seven data puzzles online. So again, we're working on one, we're looking at one data puzzle tonight. And once you're familiar with the framework for this one data puzzle, it's the same for, for all of the other data puzzles. So with that, I wanted to dive in to first to the website um, to kind of orient us all with regards to like how would you find this resource again in the future and what is involved what is included in this particular resource uh, and then we'll engage with that eliciting of students ideas practice together so in the chat i'm going to add a link to the data puzzles collection page uh, this page is going to look different here in the next few months. Uh, every webinar that I'm uh, facilitating, I'm recording and we'll add a different webinar recordings here shortly. So um, in the last couple of weeks, I've facilitated a webinar focused on the tracing carbon through the Arctic food web resource, the tipping point resource, and now we're diving into this mega droughts in the Colorado River Basin resource. Each of these data puzzles comes with a teacher guide, a slide deck, a student worksheet, and embedded in the teacher guide is an answer key. Uh, and so all the teacher guides for these data puzzles look the same. There's a little bit of background information about the resource. Um, and on, again, on the first page at the bottom, there's a lesson overview about what students are going to do. Uh, most of these data puzzles, we anticipate them taking two days to complete, so 120 minutes. This is written for 60-minute class periods. Um, day one, uh, or you can see I've broken them up into different parts. So there are four parts to these data puzzle resources uh, representing the four ambitious science teaching practices. And these different parts are explained in more detail on pages three and four. On the second page of these teacher guides, there is an instructional overview table where you'll find the different standards we're building towards, um, the investigative question, the question that students are seeking to explain, um, what students will do statements. Here is where you'll find the slide deck, student worksheet, and the answer key. We'll look at each of these resources here tonight. Materials prep, some vocab, and then uh, describing the different parts in more detail uh, below. We got a little pedag pedagogical pop-up for each of the parts, kind of a fun alliteration 
uh, that uh, Melissa came up with. So trying to really spell out what are the goal, goals of each of these ambitious science teaching practices, the goals of each of these parts, what are you trying to accomplish? So trying to help focus that there for you uh, and then describing what you should be doing with each part, um, linking different videos, resources, among other things. At the bottom, um, in doing and developing these resources, I spend a lot of time watching videos, watching webinars, reading articles, and I try to keep track of the ones that I think are that I've that I've learned the most from and I think would be helpful for educators. I try to imagine when I'm making these like if I were teaching this, what would I do, what would I want to read. Uh, and so I uh, try to have compiled these additional teaching resources at the bottom of each teacher guide, uh, should you be interested in exploring this, these concepts, these phenomena in a little bit more detail. So that's, that's the teacher guide, all look the same. Um, and we'll go back to, we'll look at a student worksheet uh, in a little bit. We'll go back to the slide deck. Uh, and you should know that many of the slides included in this slide deck are taken directly from the slide deck um, that you would use with your students. Without further ado, I'm going to ask, this will be, we'll see if we can get some participation here. We're not going to breakout rooms tonight, but I'm going to ask that we utilize the chat just a little bit. Uh, and you can put your student hats on for this one. Imagine uh, you're presenting this opening scenario to your students and, and uh, trying to elicit your students idea and see what they might come up with. Uh, so the goal in this first part is to elicit students idea about an opening scenario that's similar to the science investigation presented in the data puzzle. So student experiences, ideas, language that can be really helpful and useful resources to help students make sense of phenomena. And so we're trying to pull that out here. And as the facilitator, you may choose to record these student experiences on a piece of butcher paper or in a Google Doc. You may choose to pause if students use words um, that maybe others aren't familiar with and add them to word walls or however you do that in your, your classroom, but making student thinking uh, visible via discussion or you know, physically visible, really good strategies here. Um, for, for teachers that have piloted these resources in the past, uh, they've used some different facilitation strategies. Some use some do a warm up prompt in their class uh, at the beginning of every class. And so this part one eliciting students ideas, this could be your warm up prompt. You could uh, do a think pair share. We've had other teachers use whiteboards in small groups um, as students um, engage with this opening scenario. But you should note that this opening scenario, this eliciting students ideas practice is there's nothing in the student worksheet that says anything about this particular um, ambitious science teaching practice. So again, this is going to be you, whether you use a science notebook or just facilitate this via discussion or your classroom use whiteboards, whatever you you're the experts, uh, you're those ones working with students. So utilize those routines that you have in your classroom to engage students in this practice. The opening scenario for this particular data puzzle resource is we're asking students to study the images below and just kind of make some observations and ask some questions. What do you notice and when, what do you wonder? And so I'm gonna ask you all in the chat here to add a notice or a wonder to the chat when you're looking at these two images what do you notice and and, and or what do you wonder about what you're seeing awesome thanks tina one has more water Bare soil and rock. Cool. What are the dates for the when did when, are, when did the when did this happen? A lot more trees in one than another. Same landscape, different water levels. Cool. I love that. 
right? Trying to use, here's this bridge, appears to be the same landscape, but looks a little different with so much more bare rock and soil. So Chase, cool, good observation. Maybe, maybe I should, I pulled this, I pulled this offline, but maybe I need to get, make sure it's the exact same perspective just so there isn't, there isn't that ambiguity is not there. What happened to all the water? Different water colors, cool, more narrow on the right. These are great, great noticings, great wonderings. And so again, these are things you, you could imagine doing this as a warm up. You can imagine doing this on a whiteboard or just having students think by themselves for a moment and then share these, these observations and questions with a partner, plant cover, right on. So the, what I would do is just kind of let these, let these noticings and wonderings come out. Um, some of the things you're all saying, you're looking at the water level, you're kind of noticing that maybe the this is really narrow in comparison with the image on the, the left. Maybe is there less water in this image on the right than there is on the left? Maybe that uh, the decline in water level might have something to do with there being more uh, exposed dirt and soil. Um, look, some of you are noticing different colors of the trees and the sky, uh, but we're really gonna focus in on you know, what's happening with the, the water levels? Why is the water level uh, so, so much lower in the image on the right than the image on the left? Um, you know, and maybe students might start thinking about like, well, maybe there's more of this exposed uh, landscape because the water level is decreasing. And this will come up again later as we engage with the puzzle, uh, the puzzle plot text. Um, but, you know, I imagine two students are going to start to talk, they might make mention of, you know, things like precipitation or, you know, maybe, you know, some students have a really hard time sticking to notice and wondering. So maybe we start talking about drought or dry conditions and some of those words and some of those students ideas kind of wanted to pull out and focus. And after the expl exploring those noticing and wonderings, make clear that these are two images from the same uh, location and uh, are this documenting the same reservoir from similar locations. This is Lake Oroville uh, in Northern California. Um, the image on the, this is about 150 miles Northeast of San Francisco. Um, and this image is taken in April of 2017. Uh, this image was taken in April of um, 2021. So just four years later. Uh, you can see the water levels are very different and getting students to think about what might be causing the difference in the water levels uh, could be a, could uh, start a really good discussion. Um, in particular, Lake Oroville, like lots, lots of parts in the West of the United States are experiencing drought and another opportunity to engage students in this kind of conversation about drought um, would be to ask students to think about a time maybe they've experienced a drought or heard about a drought. And if this is a really sensitive topic, uh, especially in your area, wherever you may be, please make sure you're, you're being sensitive and, and empathetic in your discussions about this. Um, but I, I think that students have a lot to offer in terms of you know, where they may have experienced droughts, what was the weather like, and really we're trying to listen for things like, you know, was it hot or no precipitation? Was there, when was the last time it rained? Or what did the water level look like uh, where you were? If you were near a river, did you see changes there? And so trying to pull out those student experiences, just to preview what's coming, we're gonna be looking at temperature and precipitation data sets for the Colorado River Basin. And so, when students are, when we're, you're facilitating a conversation around this question, you're really wanting to key in on terms like temperature, precipitation, or like it was hot, or it was wet, or it was dry, like those words we want to really pull out. Uh, and so many of us have again experienced or heard of droughts, and these are periods of dryness that might last, you know, a year or a few years. Um, but in this data puzzle, we're going to be meeting and engaging with work um, 
by a scientist, a hydrologist, Seth Ahrens, who's studying uh, a mega drought, an ongoing mega drought in the Colorado River Basin, the upper and co lower Colorado River Basin in the southwestern United States. And the difference between a drought and a mega drought or mega droughts are periods of extreme dryness that last for several decades. Uh, so really the time, the, the, the time, time period, how long these droughts last is what is what really caught is uh, explaining or, or the reason we, call, we use the term mega drought. So on this particular slide here, when you're introducing Seth, you really wanna highlight the, the Colorado River Basin. This is a massive basin where, again, where when it rains in these areas, the water flows into, this is the Colorado River. And the Colorado River Basin, again, makes is made up of an upper and a lower basin. Uh, it crosses seven U.S. states and two states in Mexico. Um, there are 29 indigenous tribes in, in the Colorado River Basin. There are five, more than 5 million acres of farmland and about 40 million people um, rely on water from the Colorado River Basin in the southwestern U.S. So lots of people, lots of states, lots of people affected by this ongoing drought in the southwest. So um, given that background, given that context, your know, student experience with drought, kind of connecting um, their experiences and introducing Seth and his work with the mega drought in the, in the Colorado River Basin, we use that uh, to frame and jump into this second practice here, identifying important science ideas where this is where you would actually physically hand out the student worksheet. Uh, and the goal here is to have students engage with an interactive reading um, by uh, helping them read through this text and helping them connect science ideas from the reading back to the opening scenario. Uh, you'd be summarizing key ideas, important science ideas with an annotated sketch, uh, and you identify the investigative questions scientists are seeking to answer. So for this uh, in your classroom, this might be a whole class read aloud. Maybe this is students uh, read independently and follow some close reading strategies that you utilize in your classroom already. So there are a couple of different ways to facilitate this part. You should know that there are um, some videos uh, and data visualizations and some other things embedded in the puzzle plot text to hopefully make the text come alive a little bit more and help students visualize uh, some of the things that they're reading. Uh, so that's why we've had a number of, of teachers uh, choose to use read aloud as a class and pause and play uh, videos together. What we're going to do right now um, is to have you take five minutes to read that puzzle plot text, this background text on your own, just so you have a little bit more context as we move into um, the, the ambitious science teaching practices to come. Uh, and this is a slide directly from the slide deck you would use with students, uh, in, which, in which you'd say, you know, we're gonna learn more about the mega drought in the Colorado River Basin by reading, reading this text. And when students are reading, we're gonna ask that they circle the investigative question and underline similarities between the reading and the opening scenario, trying to make the connection between their experiences and what's going on in the text. So that said, I am going to add the student worksheet to the chat right now. And I'm going to ask that you take the next five minutes. I'll put up a timer on my screen. You take the next five minutes uh, and read through the text, check out some of the pictures. When we return, I'm gonna watch, we're gonna watch this video, this four minute video as a group. Um, but yeah, just wanna give you a little bit of time to uh, explore the resource. Uh, read up on the, the background text here uh, and kind of envision how you might facilitate this practice with your students. We'll see you in five minutes.
gonna stop the timer here so you don't get the the ringing sounds and head to the student worksheet where you are all um where you're all at right now and, and just kind of kind of point out a few things here one like the start of this text really trying to introduce students to the american southwest the colorado river basin and the importance of this area and this water resource to so many people. Uh, this video here, which we'll watch in just a second here, uh, takes students to uh, Lake Mead, to the Hoover Dam, where you can really see uh, the bathtub rings that are we highlight in this picture and that are discussed in the text, uh, among some other things. So hopefully like bringing students there so they know, you know, they can actually imagine what they're reading about, the places they're reading about. Uh, on the second page here, highlighting, you know, what drought is, the difference between water gain and water loss, uh, and, and highlighting that this mega drought is this extreme period of extreme dryness that's been lasting for decades in the Colorado River Basin. Also want students to think about uh, the connection between temperature and what is potentially a, a new term for them, evapotranspiration, the loss of, loss of water. Uh, directly from the Earth's surface via evaporation and through plants via transpiration. And that becomes a really important concept later on when we're, we're kind of using temperature and, and as this proxy for evapotranspiration. We reached out to a bunch of folks here. We don't have an evapotranspiration uh, data set for the, the Colorado River Basin. So kind of challenging students to make the connection All right increasing temperatures, increase in the amount of, of water loss to the atmosphere through um, evaporation and transpiration. Um, you can see the investigative question here, what Seth and others are, are investigating, what's causing the, the 2000 to 2021 mega drought in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, and also want students to think about other ways that, that water might be lost in this area or extracted uh, due to farming and other uh, human practices in this, this area that's booming in terms of population. So with that, I want to quickly watch, I think we've got time, this video here. Uh, hopefully it gives you a better idea as to like how we're going to connect students to this area, to mega drought. Um, on Earth looks at the punishing drought gripping much of the western U.S. Scientists are calling it a mega drought brought on by climate change. Now look at this map. The latest U.S. drought monitor map shows large areas of the southwest are exceptionally dry. That's never good. The worst category is taking a dramatic toll on the Colorado River system that provides water to 40 million people in seven different states. CBS News senior environmental correspondent that's Ben Tracy traveled to the iconic Hoover Dam and shows us how the federal government may be forced to make a drastic and historic decision. I mean, it's amazing to see it up close. For more than eight decades, the Hoover Dam has relied on water from Nevada's Lake Mead to cover up its backside. But now at age 85, it finds itself uncomfortably exposed. Much of the water the dam is supposed to be holding back is gone. This is like a different world. Pat Mulroy is the former head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. She says Lake Mead, the nation's largest reservoir, is on track to soon hit its lowest level ever recorded. This part of the Colorado River system is a crucial water supply for Las Vegas, Phoenix, and Southern California. It makes the vast agricultural land of the desert southwest possible. This landscape screams problems to me. I mean, just look at the bathtub rings. To me, that is an enormous wake up call. Lake Mead is at just 37% of its capacity. It hasn't been full since back in 2000 when the water came right up to the top of Hoover Dam. This is what it looks like now. Since 2000, Lake Mead has dropped 130 feet. That's hard to imagine, but picture a 13 story building on top of my head and way up there, that's where the water used to be. So you and I talked here back in 2014. We and did. at that time, I asked you, how critical a point are we at? It's a pretty critical point. If you look at 30 feet lower now, what point are we at? We're at a tipping point. It's an existential issue for Arizona, for California, for Nevada. It is just that simple. 
For the first time ever, the federal government is expected to declare a water shortage on the lower Colorado River later this summer. That will force automatic cuts to the water supply for Nevada and Arizona starting in 2022. Homeowners have higher priority and at first won't feel the pain as badly as farmers. If we don't have irrigation water, we can't farm. Dan Thielander is a second generation family farmer in Arizona's Pinal County. The water to grow his corn and alfalfa fields comes from Lake Mead. So next year we're going to get about 25% less water, means we're going to have to fallow or not plant 25% of our land. In 2023, Thielander and other farmers in this part of Arizona are expected to lose nearly all of their water from Lake Mead. So they're rushing to dig wells to pump groundwater to try to save their farms. Is the future here, honestly, I hate to say it, but it's uh, pretty cloudy. This is an engineering marvel for sure. Back at Hoover Dam, facility manager Mark Cook has his own concerns. Lake Mead has dropped so much that it's cut the dam's hydropower output by nearly 25%. So these are generating the electricity, these things? Yep, exactly. He wanted to show us the new turbine blades they just installed. So right below us right here is that, is that brand new turbine. Designed to keep the power flowing efficiently at rapidly dropping lake levels. At some point, the dam could stop producing electricity altogether. Our previous number was at elevation 1050, and now we've lowered that number to 950. So we, uh, so we bought ourselves 100 feet. All those islands were underwater? Completely submerged. Pat Mulroy says a rapidly retreating reservoir may be the new normal, and the millions of people who rely on this water supply will have to quickly learn to live with less of it. We don't change unless we absolutely have to. Well, when you look out at this lake, I think that moment of it's absolutely necessary has arrived. For CBS This Morning, Ben Tracy, Lake Mead, Nevada. Wow, that... Great, so that video serves a number of different purposes. I think uh, one, right, it helps students visualize the landscape and the importance of that resource for so many people. And also, you know, it's pretty striking to see those bath type tub rings. And when that, um, the, the anchor there shows like, you know, 100, what 140 feet looks like when they pan up, like hopefully a lot of really powerful visuals for students. Um, as they're making sense of, of this puzzle plot text and trying to identify important science ideas and connect it back to their personal life. So a lot of things happening here. Um, also embedded in this identifying important science ideas practice after students read this text, watch some videos, perhaps you the facilitator have a few discussions with those videos. Students, we, we strategically have them uh, focus on a particular science idea and have them create some sort of annotated sketch for a particular question. In this case, we want students to draw and describe the relationship between temperature and evapotranspiration as it was defined in that text. And hopefully the visual up here with the arrows, precipitation and the red representing water evapotranspiration, water being lost, help students or prompts them to think about how they might draw, annotate this particular image. So this is, these are background images. These are little trees and shrubs and a river that students will then annotate on top of. So this is uh, from the, this is the answer key here where we're, we have a thermometer and you can see it's cooler in one image than another. The red arrow representing water loss and you can see the arrows are larger where it's warmer and a little bit smaller where it's cooler. So just trying to get students to, to describe here in a visual and text that warmer, te warmer temperatures, we see an increase in the rate at which water is lost from the Earth's surface through evapotranspiration. Also want students to, to write down the investigative question. This is the question that they themselves will be trying to explain later on what's causing the 2000 to 2021 mega drought in the Colorado River Basin. In the text, it talks about how Seth is looking at long-term patterns um, in precipitation and temperature data sets for the region. And so as we make a prediction, as students make a prediction for this question, we're asking them to really think about precipitation, temperature, maybe even like how, um, let me fix that right now, how, 
how the demand for water has changed and, and so how might they uh, what might they predict is causing this this current mega drought after students have have kind of annotated this sketch about the relationships between temperature and evapotranspiration highlighted Seth's investigative question and made a prediction for that question uh, that's when we move into going to go back to the slide deck here that's when we move into this um, Third practice, supporting students' ongoing changes in thinking. And so again, we've elicited students' ideas about uh, a drought um, in that puzzle plot text. We've, we're helping students connect their experience to the text. And there are some slides in the actual slide deck that help, help the facilitator, you, the, the facilitator, do that help students pull out some important science ideas with some different videos and visuals and really specific questions. Uh, and once students make a prediction for that investigative question, we get to test their predictions against authentic data. So this is where they're gonna be analyzing some different data sets, in this case, long-term uh, temperature and precipitation data sets for the Colorado River Basin. Uh, one of the things that came out of uh, Melissa and, and others' work in, in writing that ambitious science teaching book is that it's so important to talk about graphs before you have students analyze graphs. And in particular, uh, have students analyzing specific points uh, proved to be really a really helpful strategy in having students orient themselves um, with respect to the data sets. You could, you the facilitator, you could have students work individually in pairs, use whiz whim strategies, what I see, what I mean, other strategies that your students are accustomed to, feel free to implement those in your classroom to help students make sense of these data sets. And so we're gonna now segue, we're gonna look into, look into um, our predictions, test our predictions about what's causing the mega drought by looking at temperature and precipitation data. Uh, and so this, these are slides that you'd be using with your students to help uh, orient them to the data set before you have them go analyze the data set and, and answer some questions on their own. Talk about it as a class. In this particular slide, we can see we're looking at the Colorado River Basin temperature. So average temperatures and degrees Fahrenheit here on the y-axis over about a 120 year time frame. So since 19, the year 1900 to the present, we're looking at average temperatures for the Colorado River Basin. Just have students point out highest temperature, lowest temperature, what years those took place. You can see we've got the highest temperature in the year 2017. That's a, a number of really high temperatures in the last 20 years. Some other really high spikes, um, 1980 around and 1935, but you know, overall, we see that the highest peak are here in 2017, lowest around 1913. We do the same for students with temperature or precipitation. I'm sorry, we're looking at average precipitation for the Colorado River Basin uh, over a 120 year period since 1900. Um, and then we ask students to think about where, what years were the, the highest average precipitation? When did those take place? You can see those really stand out. Um, and which years did the lowest uh, average precipitation take place? You can see we've got a couple of really low ones. Most recently in 2020, looks like it's the lowest, another really low one in the early 2000s. Um, but you can also see, um, you know, where we might be going with this as well. Like in the temperature data set, you can really see this clear increasing temperature pattern from about 1975 to the present in the last 20 years. Uh, lots of really high temperatures, really warm. Um, whereas in precipitation, maybe a slight decreasing trend, but really no, no, significant, no huge pattern, no huge trend in terms of precipitation. But something to note, um, you know, these last 20 years, we do see a couple of really dry years and we don't see any huge replenishing any big uh, precipitation year over the last 20 years so some important things that students could could hopefully identify when they're answering questions four through seven on their student worksheet which asks students to find high and low points in terms of temperature and precipitation ask students to 
identify patterns in the data set if there are any. And so hopefully um, the, the goal here is for students to really, you know, key in on the fact that temperatures in the Colorado River Basin are increasing uh, pretty dramatically. And in fact, over the last 20 years, like lots of really high temperatures. Um, with regards to precipitation, no, no real trend, maybe a slight decreasing trend, but there haven't been any real wet years over the last 20 years. And we see, you know, 2020 being the driest year over the last 120 years and some really dry periods. So it's kind of the story here is a little bit of a, a combination of both in that it's been a little bit dry over the last 20 years, um, but you know, with really high temperatures, um, the mega drought can be explained by higher temperatures, higher rates of water loss via evapotranspiration, uh, and couple those high temperatures with maybe diminished precipitation for the region. Those are the two factors, temp increased temperatures, little bit decreased precipitation driving uh, the mega drought in the Colorado River Basin. Now, that's a lot more information than what uh, your students might come up with at this point. Right? Having them um, look at these data sets, identify patterns, kind of uh, test their predictions. Um, you know, how would what did they predict in terms of the cause of the mega drought, and how do these data sets support or refute those predictions? Uh, and and after kind of going over those student questions um, together as a class, we're ready to construct this evidence-based explanation where we're bringing in student experience and language from the eliciting practice, uh, some important science ideas from that puzzle plot text, that interactive reading, and then the, the data analysis piece into one final explanatory model. So this is where students are gonna finalize new understandings and ideas about the investigative question, what's causing the 2000 to 2021 mega drought in the Colorado River Basin by constructing explanatory models and Students can construct these models individually or in pairs. These models, when I'm using these models in this particular resources, I'm talking about annotated sketches. Um, for those of you that might be familiar with um, a public record called the Gotta Have It Checklist, if there is disagreement among students about what's causing the mega drought in the Colorado River Basin, uh, this resource can be really helpful in help having students come to a consensus. Uh, and so basically uh, you would facilitate a, a conversation with students about all the different ideas that they think are and factors that are causing the mega drought. And students would have to argue their case and come to a consensus before that idea is put on a piece of butcher paper or a whiteboard as something that you just gotta have in that final model. And so again, that's co-constructed. Uh, with students and, and reviewing signs and symbols, modeling conventions. These got to have it checklists, a got to have it checklist slide and a signs and symbols slide are embedded in the slide deck for the resource. So should you choose to, to create a got to have it checklist with your class or, or help students uh, with modeling conventions, those slides are in there. Going to cut right to the chase and and uh, show you a, a screenshot from the answer key. Um, this is a, a final model, an annotated sketch for the investigative question: What's causing the mega drought in the Colorado River Basin? You can see it's very similar to that sketch that students may have produced earlier, and that's by design. That first sketch is kind of practice, and hopefully this. It can refine those ideas uh, for their final model. And so you can see I'm calling the past this period of 1900 to 1999. We can see temperatures were a little cooler. These red arrows are representing water loss. Uh, and you can see they're a little bit smaller. Uh, the blue arrows are representing precipitation coming in. I'm really just trying to compare the past and the present. In the present, we're seeing much warmer temperatures. That's supported by the data set. Um, warmer temperatures are, are indicate are, um, lead to higher rates of evapotranspiration, which I'm indicating with some larger red lines. Uh, we've decreased. We've kind of taken some water here um, out of the Colorado River or Lake Mead or Lake Powell. Um, kind of an example to show like water levels are declining. 
Uh, and maybe these arrows, these blue arrows, they're similar, but maybe these blue arrows are a little bit smaller to represent uh, a little bit of a decline in precipitation over the last 20 years. And so hopefully, you know, you can start to see here a lot of really important ideas um, in terms of like temperatures are rising, higher rates of water loss to the atmosphere. Precipitation story is a little bit muddled, but really the, the warming temperatures due to be caused by um, human emissions and the greenhouse effect are what are driving this mega drought in the Colorado River Basin. So hopefully that's coming out here in this final um, explanatory model. At the end of all of these, after students finish their explanatory models, there's a digging deeper question. Try to think, have students think about their own impact uh, or others impact and what we might be able to do about this. And so uh, in this, this particular case, the question is what factors other than precipitation and temperature are likely contributing to the decline in water levels? And so through the video and in the text, there, there is this human element of increasing demands on the Colorado River and um, for water resources. And so challenging students to think about, you know, you know, how can we live more sustainably in these really arid climates um, is the focus of this question and what can we do to, to be more sustainable. So um, that's the goal for this kind of ex extension question. Also included here, this is optional, but after that digging deeper question, this is a really engaging video that talks about how humans are rely on water in the, the Southwest. Um, so trying to, again, kind of put it all together here with, with the summative video. So that is the resource here. And I know, I'm, I apologize, I'm really focused on the, the slides and haven't been as good here um, in the chat, but I see some really awesome, some really awesome things in the chat. I'll try to to check out here in just a moment. Um, and, and if you want to stay on a little bit longer, um, we can look at some of the things in the chat together. But before everybody takes off, I know some people have said they already have to leave. I wanted to just say that um, if you are interested in using this particular resource in your classroom and providing feedback to me um, via a survey. I'm going to ask that you complete this form. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. This is also a form for those of you that want to receive a one hour uh, webinar uh, certificate from us. So if you want to receive a one out, oh, it's not the tipping point. I'm sorry, I need to correct that. This is for the mega drought data puzzle that we just walked through. If you're interested in piloting and providing feedback for the mega drought data puzzle, please fill out this form here. And or if you would like a one hour webinar certificate for attending uh, this tonight, please click on that link in the chat. Fill out your name, add your email, say you'd like to receive a certificate, uh, and, and then submit this form. So um, that would be awesome. I am going to move to the next slide and kind of promote some of the other things that I am up to. We've got one more webinar in this four-part series. Next week, we'll be looking at a data puzzle that focuses on megafires. Um, are they rare occurrences or is this, are they the new normal? Um, and so we'll be looking at a mega fire data set. Um, so that's next week, kind of looking towards the summer. I've got a couple of different professional development opportunities. I'm going to be running a two day workshop uh, focused on a, a storyline and curriculum I wrote called The Future of Forests, in which students construct models to explain how landscapes recover after wildfires. And so basically through using data explorer so tools produced by the U.S. Forest Service, looking at soil moisture data sets from NASA satellites, some case studies, some different games, students are going to construct explanatory models to show how uh, patterns of succession, post-fire succession, have shifted in a warmer, drier world. If you attend this two-day workshop, you get a certificate from me for 10 hours of PD and the option to purchase a grad credit from CU Boulder. And kind of the same story 
At the end of July, I've got a unit focused on a changing Arctic ecosystem, uh, which students will uh, construct explanatory models to explain how declining sea ice will impact organisms large and small in the Arctic. So same thing, 10 hours of PD option to purchase a guide credit if you're interested in participating in that. Yes, Chris, I'll add these in the bit.ly chat. And I'm also gonna follow up via email um, that will have a, this recording, this webinar recording, as well as all of these PD offer opportunities. And I'll also include this slide deck. So as always, I ramble too much in the beginning and then I'm just jamming this stuff in at the end. Gosh, you'd think I would learn not to do that, but I do it every time and I have it recorded. 